All right. So, four. Segment four, we are starting with Lord Amadeus. Really? Okay, yeah, Lord Amadeus. Uh, and we are now going to be talking about the art of fear. So, sir, and if you've already answered it, go ahead and just sum it up one more time for folks who didn't watch any of the other videos. How do you build suspense and maintain a sense of dread throughout the one shot? This is all about the fear aspect of it now. Yeah, uh, we, we've been kind of talking about this. So um, I'll sum up. Number one, I'm a realist. You're not going to have people at the edge of your seat. I mean, if you can do it great, you're the world's greatest game master. But I think really what you're going to have are moments of tension while your friend in between moments of your friends screaming about needing more beer and pizza. Um, I think focusing on sound, describing sound over visual visuals, you know, use the five senses to really kind of describe things. Um, you know, I said before, I think we're a little desen desensitized by visuals. Um, so sound to me is a little bit more visceral, you know, that the squishing of the meat as people are getting hacked to pieces, that kind of thing. Um, mystery, drips of information to, to keep players kind of hooked and wondering what the heck is going on and um you know play off their psychology you know if, if you get to see them starting to focus on something that maybe you didn't think would be important but it's important to them um and it still fits you know be flexible and work with it and um, i think you will have a very good halloween one shot so what techniques do you use to surprise and shock your players effectively? Oh, um, well, I think the, the big one is when the big when the when the big monster finally attacks, you know, it's um there's I pull no punches. I mean, I generally don't pull punches in any game I run, but uh this is particularly gruesome. Um, and it's going to almost feel like it's overpowered because, again, as I said before, I tr I make my pregens to be kind of mundane people up against the supernatural or the extraordinary or just like some terrifying experience. So um, when like the, the psychopaths who thought they were werewolves attacked, you know, um, they wrestled people to the ground and then just started eating them, you know, while they were alive, you know. Um, dealing with psycho uh, uh the the psych the psychotic break of the mm -hmm. entire military station um i mean that i had to do on the fly but all of a sudden they couldn't trust anybody as everyone's just starting shooting at each other um some of the lamentations games i've run i mean james Raggi does a great job setting that up um you really never know what's going to happen um but when it does happen it's pretty bad like death love doom where if your number's up your character, it doesn't matter how many hit points you have left, you're dismembered. It's awful. It's gruesome. Um, so that that's that's when I hit, I hit hard. And when things start to pick up speed as like you're coming to the end point, I put the pedal all the way down and I just give it as much gas as I can go. And I just don't let up. I just like keep going, keep going, keep going, push, 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 push. No, no breaks. And uh, if you survive, great. I'll buy you a beer. If not, I'll see you next Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kevin, Kevin uh, same primary question for you. How do you build suspense and maintain a sense of dread throughout the entirety of the one shot? Yeah, we talked about this a lot. Everything that Lord Mateus said, is I, I, I agree with, although I, I am a big fan of uh, show don't tell. Um, so I, I like visuals and by visuals, I mean, uh, describing a scene and setting it up, uh, so that people are like, oh my gosh. And, uh, and we talked about how I can use sound, uh, effectively to, to build and add to the tension and suspense. Um, you know, I also like to use NPCs. So you, you see, you know, some NPC you're interacting with, you find his mutilated body, uh, or you see something come out of the shadows and grab him and rip him in half. And, you know, the sort of players go, oh, my gosh. Um, uh, I like to give hints of what they're going to be up against, that, that they start to get more and more concerned 
about, oh my gosh, what is this thing? And I, and I let them research it. So it's like, oh, it seems like it's a this or that. Well, we never heard of that. So they go to the you know library at the Lazlo Agency or some university or something. And they look up the myth, myth and I give them the myth. And it's some terrible, hideous thing. Um, cause then they start to like, oh my gosh, how are we going to fight this? It's weakness is this. Let's get all that. And maybe they're actually going up against that or not. Like I said, I like to use, uh, rumors to kind of get them thinking and worrying about stuff that may or may not be actually applicable to their situation. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, it should all lead up to this big climatic confrontation whether it's with the creature itself or it's twisted human minions or it's, it's, you know, dark priest or whatever it is. Um, yeah. All of it. So, so this is probably a bad follow-up to ask you uh, for full disclosure here. I'm kind of different than these guys in the terms of like, I don't like beer and pretzel games. Um, and what I mean, what I mean by that, first of all, you're not going to be eating at a table that I'm at anyway, because my misophonia, otherwise we are going to have a horror session right there as I start slashing the players at the table. So that's always a bad thing right there. But with that said, like uh, I, I'm the guy that, you know, people like to say, Oh, Max doesn't like to have fun. Well, my fun is actually being serious in the games. That's just my style. Not that they do anything wrong or anything like that. So I say all of that because this might be a bad <laughs> follow-up question for Kevin, but I'm still going to ask it. So how do you handle moments of levity or humor that might break the tension? Now, the specific for me is in here. Levity and humor isn't necessarily bad, but there's the sometimes somebody, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sad moment, a character died, or it's a tenacious moment where you don't know where the alien is or whatever's going on, and somebody blurts something out ridiculous and just kind of loses all the tension at the table. So how do you handle those moments, and should they be avoided or embraced? I, I tend to embrace them. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, to not, not be afraid of, of humor. I think sometimes people, people need that. And um, if someone cracks a joke, it's probably because they actually needed it, Max um because it was getting a little maybe too serious or, or too dark for them uh and, and it's okay uh because you're going to recapture that suspense and tension when you you move forward with whatever is going to happen whether it's the battle or whether it's you know finding more disgusting you know clues to what you're going to be battling any second now uh i don't think it's a bad thing uh i, I like to interject humor uh, and the trick is kind of knowing when to do it. And if someone breaks it, it it's, it's okay. Uh, it's just like, you know, when you're watching a horror movie and someone starts to laugh at some, and, and I'm with you because most of the time in those moments, I get a movie and, and someone starts to laugh or several people start to laugh. I'm thinking there's nothing funny about this. Shut up. You know, this is sad or gruesome or, you know, but they needed, that's how they're handling that this, this would, would you would you uh, differentiate in character action versus out of character action in that regard? Oh, absolutely. So, like in character, for example, in the well, what was Palladium Fantasy now is I don't know what we're playing anymore. Uh, but uh, the the game that that we were playing, my character has a lot of one liners completely unintentional, but that's just the way he's come up because he's naive, he's gullible, he's young. So. I'm envisioning him like that. So I'm playing him seriously, but people in chat are cracking up. So I'm not doing it to de derail the game or diffuse a situation or whatever. So I could see the character doing it. I would be annoyed if that was the player in that case, me just trying to do, you know, do it to get some attention, so to speak. Well, yeah. I mean, again, it, it, it does get back to sort of the intention. If, if someone's just being deliberately disruptive because they want to be, you know, in the spotlight all the time, even if it's annoying, that's not fun. And it is annoying. Um, so, you know, honestly, I mean, that's where the difficult part of being a game master is you might want to pull that person aside and say, Hey, I, I appreciate, you know, you're trying to be funny here, but you're, you're, you're ruining mm -hmm. the atmosphere. Please refrain from this. Um, and maybe they will, and maybe they they won't. I, I've, I've actually had a couple of players over the years where I'm like, look, you keep this up, you can't play in my game. And sometimes they, it's like 50-50. 
sometimes they say, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry, and they stop it. And other time they keep doing it. And I say, well, that was your last game, man. I let them play out that game. And I'm like, you know, you're not, you're not welcome to come back because you're just too disruptive and you're ruining this for me and the rest of the players. Because I, I think that's fair. And, yeah, maybe you damage a potential friendship. But, I, have, you know, I have real life friends I would never play role playing games with, and we're the best of friends. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it, it it's always a little tricky, you know. When you're <laughs> but ultimately, your take is to embrace it. It's probably appropriate, you know, for the for the player, the, the character at that time. Yep. And okay, yeah, yeah. All right, Baron, how do you build suspense and maintain a sense of dread throughout a one shot? Well, it the thing is, is that you are looking at the overall there to uh -oh. I, I have to interrupt I'll, you I'll, I'll stop i'll stop i saw I have, to, I have to interrupt you sorry got a 50 dollars super chat from law dog which if my wife is still watching i need i need that 100 proof stuff <laughs> <laughs> Law Dog, crafting an atmosphere of fear, something a lot of GMs do is gloss over game mechanics. Don't let horror factor just be a role. An unholy thing emerges from the shadows. They need to feel the chill, uh, the chill gripping their heart and freezing them in place. We've talked about this in the past when it comes to just setting up encounters. Just because you roll on a random encounter table doesn't mean it's a street fighter fight. Round one, fight! Dun, 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 dun. No, set up the atmosphere around it, even if it is random or what, and, and horror that's doubly important. These guys have given you a million tips. There we go. Tips and tricks, uh, you know, on, on how to do that tonight. Could not agree more. <laughs> Earth on, I'm not drinking twice for you, jerk. Uh, but thank you. Uh, I would rather not have the bottle, but the shot. Yeah, thank you. But, and I will let, while I'm uh, burning my throat with this, I will let these guys comment on that as well. To you, Law Dog, thank you very much for the $50 super chat. Well, that wasn't so bad for being 20 more proof. Underproof Southern Comfort, apparently, is what she gave me. So, <laughs> thank you. Good stuff. Yeah, you hey, gotta do gonna... another shot because you didn't do the full stutter after you did the shot. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, man your alcoholism is showing <laughs> you know I, i'm a lightweight now i honestly am when i was in the military i could drink you know for my size because i'm not a big guy anyway i could drink a lot now if i were to have two more of those i wouldn't be able to run the stream anymore like, Flo, what? <laughs> what did you guys say? you know i just lose my damn mind but back on target here for the 50 dollars um and then baron you can go to anything you guys want to say on this comment well, I mean, yeah, I tend to, I tend to agree, um, and that's why in in my game we have horror factor, and whenever someone succumbs to it, I do describe the chills and that they're feeling, and in the stark terror, and how they curl up in a little ball and start to whimper, uh, or how they just they can't stand there for another minute and they have to flee and run away, so. That's the biggest horror of them all, what Max just had on the screen. No, no, I saw that. No, no, when, when I'm drunk, I turn into such a happy drunk, I annoy people because I'm always high-fiving folks, and I sing everything, and I sing like, as my wife says, I sound like two cats fucking when I sing, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, And Sheris has been there for a lot of the drunken exploits back in the day, so uh, he knows. All right, Baron. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Lord, Lord Max, is there anything you want to say in that as well, or? I just want to say I agree. I agree with that completely. Um, you don't want there. There's nothing that will ruin your game, horror game, any game, but especially horror. If everything just gets reduced down to a role, um, I think very few mechanics. And we've talked about Alien. I'm sure we'll talk about it again. Uh, really bridge that divide between the real and the unreal, the fantasy. Mm -hmm. uh, but if so, but if you if a role comes up that's related to the fear. Um, start with the description and then say make your role or make the role and then interpret it. Don't just say, okay, you're scared now. You know, like, make them feel it. Got it. And it's good to see RPG Grandma here. I haven't seen you in a while, RPG Grandma. I'm glad you're here. All right, Baron. I'll ask the question again. I know you started to answer it. I apologize, but I have to do the $50 ones like that. So uh, how do you build suspense and maintain a sense of dread throughout the one shot? It, it, it is all about description. Weaving the story. It was basically when you're doing a more of a horror side, you know, it, it kind of goes with what we just, you know, the, the, 
Lord Matthias and, and Kevin both said is that you know you have to have that you know that explanation. And truthfully, you know, and and I'm going to actually kind of backtail his about the whole, you know, the humor side. Read the room. If you need to, if you need that break, do it. Mm-hmm. And it's the same same way the other way. If they're starting to get a little too giggly, ramp up the horror side or or the suspense or or the thriller side or whatever you want to call it. Ra- start ramping that up. You just re- the easiest thing to do is just read the room and and make the adjustments on the fly because that is going to actually not only give you but the players at the table a better feeling at the end of that they're going to be like wow that was like really scary i loved it or you'll even have people come up to you afterwards going thank you for making me laugh because i it, it was just starting to get a little too much and you know everybody's different everybody's level is different so you know yeah yeah i'm the opposite there that would drive me angry but but on the flip side as the player i also have to read the room as well you know so i i do recognize that it's not just the game master side of it but yeah it's like dude we're in such an intense moment and then you blurted that thing out <sighs> that that would be my normal reaction but you know, I'm I'm well, I'm in the minor. I also know that I'm in the minority on this. So, if you had one, one, just one, piece of advice that you could give to game masters to create a memorable and lasting Halloween horror fearful experience, what would that one piece of advice be? Don't overthink it. That that's the biggest thing because the minute you start overthinking it. It's it's going to derail the entire entire you know if you want to call it creative process for your one shot it'll derail the whole thing you know just don't overthink it you know it's like I said earlier keep it simple that that's the easiest way to to make sure that you give the players in yourself a very memorable game and it's not even just with horror this is across the board you know just. You know, because a lot of times as GMs, we overthink. We know our players overthink because most of us have sat at a table and we've overthought everything. And then it had been like, oh, well, I guess I didn't need to do that. So, I mean, it's just keep it simple. You know, keep keep to the core of the story you want to tell. Okay. Yeah, I love that. Sorry. I love that. I love that. I also love reading the room. I, I don't think people mention that enough. I know I don't. It, it's good to read the room. And yeah, keep it simple. And you know, and that means, you know, make sure your players are having fun. If you're having fun and your players are having fun, that's the whole point. All right. Um, anything that you guys want to piggyback on in terms of uh, like the setting or the game itself before we go into the last question of the night? Okay. Uh, don't have any. Su- well, we already read the super chat. Thanks again, Law Dog. Really do appreciate that. So uh, where are we at? Where are we at on the monies? Uh, we're at ninety four dollars and ninety nine cents. So one more, you know, five dollar and one cent super chat gives us a giveaway. But we'll do that in segment five. So so because yeah. I know Kevin's got to go at some point here, and I don't know how long Lord Maddie just wants to hang out or you. Um, I'm but- here for the duration. Sweet. <laughs> we, we keep telling Kevin, we're going to have a two hour stream. It's always four hours. Like, mm, here we go again. He got kind of mad at me about that last time. But um, this is weird. I'm missing part of my what I'm supposed to say here. So before we go into the next segment, I want to quickly go around and let's introduce everybody right before the last question one more time here, just in case you didn't watch the first videos here. So uh, please, Lord Matty, starting with you, remind us who you are, what you create, and where we can find you on the internet. Um, I'm a game master, uh, would be content creator and game designer author. I have a YouTube channel, Rumble channel. I have my linked tr- uh, tree, link tree. It will be in down it's, below. It's in the description. Yep. Yeah, I write. I I just published a, a game called uh, Isle of the Sapphire God. You can find it at Giant Slayer Games or at the Red Room. Um, I recommend going to Giant Slayer Games, and I forgot to mention this the first time. 
I am part of a crowdfunding campaign for a thing called Deck of Many Triggers. Mm -hmm. We got 22 days left. We just need, I think, 72 more to hit our funding goal. Um, it's fun. It's hilarious. A uh, bunch of us worked on it, everything from Neckbeardia to Grim Jim uh, to Guard Bro to Patty's Parlor Games, um, uh, Diversity and Dragons. We It was a lot of fun. It, it's, it's a fun product. It's very unique, niche, exclusive. You're not going to see it again. So go to Giant Slayer Games, buy some stuff from Giant Slayer Games, and back the deck. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Not a problem. Uh, Kevin, uh, you know, I th I would think that people who watch our channel know who you are. But you know what? We actually had somebody who was going to be on that didn't know you. So maybe you're going to have to tell us who you are, what you create, where they can find you on the Internet. Yeah, ab absolutely. I'm uh, Kevin Sambita. I'm the founder and publisher of Palladium Books. We've been doing role-playing games of every genre you can imagine for the last 43 years. Uh, we got some pretty good stuff. Uh, I highly recommend you go to PlaydeumBooks.com and check us out. Uh, we have everything from science fiction to superheroes to horror and fantasy. Uh, zombies. <laughs> Brand Baron keeps mentioning zombies. We have a great zombie book of all kinds of different zombies. And those zombies are unique by the way. It isn't just a generic... I, I'm so tired of the zombie trope since like 2000. Yeah, but... The zombies in there are crazy unique. You will find interesting ways to use them. Yeah, and again, we focus on fun. So, uh, and and uh, all of our games use the same basic combat and skill system. So, if you learn one, uh, you can pretty much play them all. There's some little differences here and there. Um, you know, we're uh, me and my partner uh, Sean are on Legion of Myth regularly and Glitter Boys and. Uh, we're starting to do some really cool stuff on the Palladium Books YouTube channel. So, uh, yeah, scope us out and uh, have some fun. Yeah, I suggest going to watch those Glitter Boy historical episodes as a primer to what they're doing now on the Palladium YouTube channel. Palladium Books YouTube channel. I think they're really good. And Baron, uh, once Baron again, remind us who you are, why do we care? I mean, uh, what you create and where we can find you on the Internet. Listen here, Spider Monkey. Chill Ooh, out. Ooh, what a reference that nobody remembers anymore. But that was a good one. Uh, no, uh, the I am Baron G Rock. I do have a YouTube channel. It's probably linked below. If not, it will be. Uh, we are uh, going to be relaunching Table Breakers here in the next few months, hopefully, if I can get everything pulled together right. Uh, and yeah, uh, make sure you, you, you join us. We're going to have all kinds of fun. And uh, I will say that that I think I besides Max, I think I'm one of the few that have actually been on panels not only now with Kevin but also with Sean. So oh yeah, yeah, yeah that's I, right. You I, have been on Rashawn. I, yeah, yeah I, so so I, I I get a little 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 of this, and uh, I, I do I do <laughs> want to say one thing. Yeah, uh, uh, Malachi, you, you got a little something. Yeah, just. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the last question. We'll start with Kevin on this one. Now, this one is specifically about the players. Again, so much of this has probably already been brought up. Somebody will complain in the future about, oh, repeat questions. Well, I never know what direction that the guests are going to go. And this is just a great way to sum things up. They summed up the gaming experience in the first question. Now let's sum up the player experience. So, Kevin, how do you adapt your horror techniques based on the players' reactions to fear and tension? Uh, I, I always uh, keep my players in mind. And, uh, yeah, I think we, we covered some of this already. Uh, I like to be flexible. I like to go where the players are taking me. Uh, as Baron said, you know, you, you start at A and you're trying to get to B. And as long as you get to B, that, that, that's great. And if the players... Uh, are taking some weird circular way around. Um, that's cool. <laughs> I, I, I kind of go with the flow. Uh, and again, as long as everyone's having fun and the story's moving forward and it feels good, uh, I'm good. And then ultimately they get to be. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I, I, I very much keep in mind what the players like and want. Uh, I keep in mind, you know, the personalities and, and things that they like or fear or hate. Uh, and, and I kind of, you know, throw those in as I think is appropriate for the situation. How do you adjust, or, or I should actually ask, do you adjust, and if so, how do you adjust if certain players seem unaffected by the horror elements, almost not engaging, while others are fully immersed? Yeah, you know, it's funny. You can only do so much. And, and, and so one way to, to, to address that is to try to give those players something specific to draw them into it. Uh, in in a more visceral way, but but sometimes you can't. Uh, there's been uh, you know plenty of games where I'm thinking, oh man, I feel bad because this person or that person doesn't seem to be really involved, and they didn't seem to have too much fun. And this is what I'm thinking. And then at the end of the game, I like to have a little wrap up where I talk about you know what happened and maybe some behind it. You guys didn't realize, but when you did this, it was brilliant because or timely because you didn't know that X, Y, and Z was about to unfold, uh, and you nipped it right in the bud, you know that kind of thing. And then inevitably, the the, the person who didn't seem to do much, or the couple of people, and, and I didn't think is is too involved, will go like. Yeah, Kev, I just want to say that was a great game. I had a blast. And it's like, I'm thinking, really? <laughs> but if they had fun, you know, not, not everyone is the same. And not everyone expresses their uh, enjoyment the same. And, uh, again, as long as your players are having fun, um, you did it right. So don't, it, it kind of gets back to what Baron was saying. Don't, don't overthink it. Keep it simple. You know, don't put too much extra pressure on you as the game master. You have fun. Hopefully they're having fun. But, you know, make sure every player gets their moment to shine. Um, that, that's, I think, is what's important. All right, Baron, how do you adapt your horror techniques based on players' reactions to fear and tension? Well, um, it, it, once again, read the room. You, you, if... You see how they're reacting. You you make your moves as, as you need to. You know if if you know that tension's ramped up and you need to, to break it. You know, drop in something crazy at them. It, it's a horror. It's a horror thing. They it make it make the unexpected happen because that will only enhance your story. And it will make a memorable night for them because they're like, I did not see that happening. You know, they're walking, they're walking through through an alley, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, this huge, you know, spider drops down and snatches up one of the NPCs that are happened to be with them. I run I like a little girl happen. as fast as I can, screaming at the top of my voice. <laughs> or, or if you want to, uh, or if you want to really, you know, mix it up. Make it a zombie drider drop down and grabs them and runs, you know? Okay, that's just bad. Hit. No, I quit that game. <laughs> <laughs> zombie but, drider. Oh, gross. <laughs> He's going to have you nightmares for my weeks. Buttons, sir. <laughs> He's going to have nightmares for weeks. <laughs> no, but no, the, you know, it, you know, make them, make them, you know, sometimes you just got to throw essentially throw stuff at the wall until something sticks yeah i mean that that truthfully that that's you know and that's with every game master you know sometimes if you're not connecting with them just start throwing stuff at the wall and see what what grabs them you know but don't do it i would say don't do it in a panic way because they'll feel that oh yeah well how are they going to know it's a panic way unless you let them know it's a panic well way. i mean you can be uh -huh. i've seen game masters do that Mm. Well, and, and reading the room kind of goes the other way too. If mm -hmm. the tension is too great and they seem to be weirding out because it's too gross or too scary, uh, pull it back. You know, ease it up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. I, I'm reading the chat here. What Per said. Per, they drew art of me when I was in the Air Force of me with bandoliers of raid. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> I used to do this outside my Air Force dorm room. I'd have two cans of Raid and a big ass lighter, and the roaches would just go popping like popcorn. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, and I'll read the super chat here in a moment. All right. Um, do I have a follow up for you? I don't think I do. You know, no, because I want to ask that as universal one. So, Lord Mattias, final question to you, although I'm going to be a liar here in a second. Uh, how do you adapt your horror techniques based on the player's reactions to fear and tension? Um, I'm going to echo a lot, but to kind of go off what Baron said, um, you know, if you start seeing, um, you know, players start to tune out, maybe, I think knowing what kind of player they are can help a lot. So if you have like a power gamer, right, this is the guy that's paying attention to all his little bonuses and the types of die roll he's going to roll for his damages and stuff. And you're going in and talking about the squishiness of the meat and the dripping of the blood and like the heavy breathing coming from down the hall. And he's like, yeah, because I got a plus five to hit. Um, yeah, he's not getting really scared because he's not he, he's seeing his uh, his stuff. That's when I start thinking of ways of taking that away. from him, You know what I mean? Um, and challenging the, the, the using the mechanics of the game to challenge him. Or, or her, you know, um, you got someone who is probably like, you know, the drama, the drama kick player who's really getting into it and maybe, um, maybe trying to hog the spotlight, you know, um, do something to stop them. You know, again, like I, I do everything when it comes to horror, I do everything opposite what I would do if I'm running a fantasy game or a sword and sorcery game, because it's all about taking away player agency, limiting their choices, making them feel like at times frustrated I'd like how can i defeat this thing that's because it's scary you know that's why that's where the fear and the horror and the terror start to sink in so but it, I, you know and it's funny like i can't believe we didn't mention read the room earlier in this conversation because that <laughs> to me is key to well me, I sometimes think really things key. are so fundamental you don't think to say them because you're yeah. like duh but oh like i like to tell people on the stream so i'm glad you guys did do that it's like what's fundamental to you and me might not be fundamental to the next guy and what's fundamental to you might not be fundamental to me so yeah it's always great to say those things yeah. So anyway, yeah, read the room and uh, see what you can do to subvert their expectations and really challenge them. And that that'll get them. Hopefully that'll be that hook. But you got to know what kind of player they are. You know, are they the beer and pretzel player? Are they the power gamer? Are they the, the drama queen? You know what I mean? That I think will help help you. It's that psychological understanding of what's happening at the table, generally speaking. So it's okay. I think I honestly I think doing horror with people, you know, is a lot easier. So, by the way, Kevin, you tell, you're saying you go to these conventions, you, you run horror games. More power to you, man. <laughs> so I would find that very challenging because I wouldn't I wouldn't know how to manipulate the players because I really don't know them. So I'd just be relying on like some of these more surface level techniques, I guess. So again, it kind of gets back to reading the room. You know, you can get a pretty good feel for players pretty quick, uh, and, and then you just sort of you know start tailoring things to what you're seeing, what you think they're going to like. And, you, you know, you're usually correct nine out of ten times. Yeah, read the room, just not like you would read Braille, because you get in trouble for that. <laughs> God. I can tell we're getting to the end of the stream. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, hey, we uh, need an attention break, okay? They were just getting, they were just cranking I had up mine. Head. I got to drink. Um, you were good. <laughs> So this is a follow-up question for all of you. Don't have to answer it if you don't have anything to add to it. You're welcome to answer it if you do. And this is about ending the session, about wrapping it up. How do you wrap up a horror one-shot in a way that leaves players with a lingering sense of either unease, come back next time, or just pure satisfaction? We'll start with Baron because uh, I think I started with him with the question. Okay, so number one, do not leave it off by finally telling your, your people that they were eating meat pies made of kids. I'm just going to put that out there. That's a reference. That's, What's that a reference to? That Connell's Christmas oh, Connell's game with game. Baba That's Yaga. Right. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But no, the you know, be like any great horror movie or book. Always leave a cliffhanger. Whether it's going to go on or not. Leave them on a cliffhanger. Even if it's a one shot. Even if it's a one shot. Interesting. Okay. Leave leave a leave a cliffhanger. It doesn't have to be a huge one, but you know they defeated the big bad. Oh, we celebrate, and then you know the 
if you want to do the whole cinematic mode, you know, you pull out and there he is. Run the looking. credits, and then after the credits, you have something else. Yeah, you know, you, you know, you, you see, you see the big bad looking down at the at, at the at the players or something like, and then you know, explain that scene to them, but you know, they don't see it. You know, this is out of you know. You know, kind of do like a cinematic type deal like that. Or, you know, leave them as a cliffhanger where, you know, oh, the big bad fell off the cliff, but you don't see the body. There, there, there's nothing there. We go what check it out. There? Nope, game over, end scene. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, pretty much. Boom. That that's where and that's where it ends. Cool. Okay. Lord Mattias. Um I like the cliffhanger idea. Um, I've done some stuff like that. I think how what you do depends on the kind of game you're running. So if it's a slasher thing and the players have just got to survive and they don't, you know, you're like, ah, oh, well, I guess everyone died, you know, and it could be kind of like this little thing you laugh off or whatever, and that's just it. But if it's something a little bit more, I'll use the word insidious again, uh, <laughs> something like darker, like more Call of Cthulhu S, where there's like this, like insidious conspiracy or whatever i think a cliffhanger would be is actually really cool um again going back to that game that went sideways real quick in the desert where the guys were shooting at each other part of it was one of the guys who was possessed initially was getting people to look inside a box and then they would look in the box and i wouldn't tell them what they see i wouldn't tell i'm excuse me i wouldn't tell the party what that person saw i would just hand him a slip of paper and that's how them they're getting possessed by this this nathaniel thornton's like psyche right so everyone died it was this bloodbath everyone's just kind of like oh man that was weird well i'm like hold on a second you know fade to black new scene it's the white house donald trump's behind the desk you know the you know he's president at the time and two cia agents come in and they got this box in their hand and they say, Mr. President, we really need to show you what's inside this box. And that was the end of it. And then he eats it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but that and they loved it. That that was like, oh yeah, oh, oh man, we gotta do we gotta get rid of this guy. How do do you do cutscenes? You know? Cause I get I get a bunch of flack because I do them very rarely, but I'll occasionally do a cutscene in my game where the characters are kind of almost like they're watching the movie for just a moment. And it helps give a lot of information. Star Wars is, is, is very famous. It gives a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Or meanwhile, literally, you know, just something out there where I can do it in a manner that gives them information in, in game context, in setting context, without having to force feed them. I guess that is force feeding. I think you know what I'm saying. But it sounds like yeah, you do no. cutscenes. I, I actually haven't in a long time because I've been playing a lot more OSR like sandbox mm -hmm. where it's really more focused on the players. But I have in, in the past used that. And I think in certain types of games, especially like Star Wars, like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, and I mean, sparingly, it's, it's got to be used sparingly. Oh, yeah. I wouldn't use it. Um, I wouldn't even use it every more, uh, you know, at least once, a se not even once a session, once every few sessions kind of thing. And um, I think it's a nice little tool to use if um, your players are stuck. Or you want to like kind of give them an idea of like where things are going. Um, in terms of horror, though, I wouldn't use it. Um, okay. and I just did that at the end to kind of wrap it up because things went foobar and that was completely <laughs> unexpected, you know. So I'm like, well, the president is possessed by the uh, ancient evil that you guys are supposed to be. Congratulations, you screwed up. <laughs> so. Okay, sounds good. I'll read this one more time just uh, in case. I've forgotten what the follow-up is. Uh, how do you wrap up a horror one-shot in a way that leaves players with a lingering sense of unease or satisfaction? Ends for Kevin. Yeah, I especially for a one-shot, I'm not a big fan of, of the cliffhanger. Because uh, I kind of feel like it, it, for me personally, I feel like it's sort of a cheat. You just spent, you know, two to four hours with me battling this thing and, you know, you didn't win at all. And, you know, it's classic in horror movies. You you often see it. They think they defeated it. And there's the clown looking up from the sewer or, you know, <laughs> Jason sinking back down or rising back up from the, the lake or whatever. And it's like, eh. But I, I like to leave them feeling, feeling very satisfied. You know, they, they, they won the day. They defeated the creature. 
uh, they can all pat themselves on the back and know that they made the world a little safer, at least for the moment. That's just me. That's how I like to end my games. So no, I think this is great. This is one of the things I find very, very important for what we're trying to do here in terms of this live stream is the differing perspective. So the fact that you do have that difference, I tend to agree with you on this one, Kevin, in a, for a one shot. In terms of one shot, as much as I like the fact that something can come back later in a campaign, in a one shot, I want to know that we either won or lost. Exactly, exactly. Um, at least from my point of view. And and the cool thing is, you can always, you know, if that same group comes back, you know, to to to, to gain with you, you know, surprise, the damn thing survived, and now you get another shot at them, uh, or or horror of horror, it, it, you know, it it looks like it's the same creature, but how can that be? And Maybe it is, maybe it's his cousin, I don't know. But, you know, it's you can still implement to that if you wanted to do that in another game. But I, I in a one-shot session, I like it to people to end feeling like, yeah, we did something good here. All right, well, that is going to end segment four, but I do have one final question for these guys, but I think they'll like it. One, I'm going to read some super It's always chapters. like, have you noticed with Max, it's always... And this is it, the final it's my, question. It's, cliffhanger. it's like Columbo. But <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I know I said it was the final one three final questions ago. That was the final one official question. No, this, this one I think uh, is important, and it's, and it's quick because we don't have to have a five-minute dissertation on this. I know, Lord Mattias, you're talking about uh, Lamentation of the Flame Princess. Kevin, I'd like you to pick one of your three, Nightbane, Beyond the Supernatural, or Dead Rain. And Baron G-Rock, which one, what game do you think is the best in your experience to run a horror one-shot? In the meantime, while you guys are thinking about that, I'm going to read these super chats that popped in. And uh, so thanks for all the tips. Thank you, Chris Preacherman. Uh, these guys have absolutely knocked it out of the park tonight in terms of answering the questions and the follow-ups and so forth. And now they're... That's right. I lied to them. I gave them an extra question. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I think it's also good to talk because really you can run a horror in any game. You really can. You can find a way to make paranoia horrible if you or horror oriented if you wanted to. But uh, the, the, all three of them have mentioned games tonight that, uh, that are kind of their go tos. And I think that those should be expressed some more. So, uh, yes, tips have been great tonight. And I thank these guys and bear. Says, do I get candy? Not for 10 Canadian dollars. You have to give me real money, man. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Barry. And we are over the threshold. So during segment five, we will have the giveaway. Uh, but I do have to wrap this up first. So thank you for all the super chats that have popped in tonight. And of course, <clears throat> whoa, I'm losing my voice. Apparently, I am supposed to end this. I want to thank Lord Mattias, Kevin Simbita, and Baron. Baron for popping in at the last second here. <laughs> the replacement and he rooted this as best as he could and you know what i think he did rudy proud he saved the day for us so thank you very much uh baron so we'll start with you baron what is your go-to game for a horror one shot typically it's going to be just because i know the system uh fairly well is going to be world of darkness yeah, because sure, okay. it's got it's got it's got everything in there and you can pull from any of the other wide books. Sounds good. Uh, Lord Mattias, tell us a little bit about Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Um, Lamentations of the Flame Princess is, I mean, while there is a core rule book, the, the product line is actually the, the IP. Every module setting, whatever, is just weird. It's horrific. Some of it's like really explicit. Some of it gets kind of deep psychological. Some of it's fun and whimsical. Um, but uh, there are some great, great modules that you can run in four to six hours. And they're, they are just great. Death Love Doom is pretty, pretty, you, you have to have a stern stomach for that. But then you have things like by Calvin Green, like Green Messiah or Strict Time Records must be kept. Great, great convention games, and they're horrific and fun and whimsical. They're, you'll have the laughs, you'll have the horror. So if you're looking for like an OSR game that's going to be scary, horrific, check out Lamentations of the Flame Princess. You will not be disappointed. All right. And Kevin, which one is your go-to? Well, you know, for those who are playing... <laughs> the answer is yes. What's your go-to? Yes. 
I, I, I've, done pretty, I've done some pretty <laughs> epic uh, Dead Rain, but my, my personal go-to is Beyond the Supernatural. Okay. I love this game. My, the thing I love about Beyond the Supernatural is the fact that you are generally mundane, but you're a psychic. Eh, your psychic powers are until the monsters around, until you really are involved with the thing that you're dealing with. You're really a mundane person with some skills. And I, it gives it the X-Files feel for those. I guess you have to be old to watch X-Files now, apparently. But uh, it really gives it that feel, that supernatural feel. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Beyond the Supernatural is a game that uh, I have to be fully honest here. I haven't played, but I know enough of it, know enough people who have that, uh, yeah, I, I love it conceptually. I think it would be great for uh, one shot. I, uh, Lamentations, I think, is probably the only time I'd play Lamentations of the Flame Princess because it's too over the top for me. But, yeah, for a Halloween horror thing, I think it fits in perfectly. And, of course, World of Darkness, yes. Uh, I mean, that's just, I think it's built for it. Timothy Frelli and I, I, I agree with Aliens, but I stress one thing. Campaign mode, I'd rather do something like Beyond the Supernatural. There are other games out there I'd rather do for campaign mode. For cinematic mode, because of its, the rules are baked in for it, Alien RPG, 100% uh, uh, agree with that. So there we go. All right. So this Sunday on uh what what is the show that i run rpg digest uh we are going to continue on with absolute power i'm going to be talking about stats derived values and part one of attributes heathen dog is going to cover the rifter number 10 and then dive into changeling metamorphs for played in fantasy and part two of the territory of arsno uh we he isn't doing the other game because he hasn't had time to complete it and fully understand it yet so he's doing the rifter and next friday there is no some rando RPG live stream. It is the members only live stream. So if you're not a member, maybe it's a good time to become one now. So you can join us. It's an ask me anything. So other than giving you a social security number, bank account information, if you've got questions, comments, concerns, please join us and ask them. And as always, if you enjoyed this discussion, please like this video, subscribe to Legion Myth to all the panelists whose links you can find in the description. A sincere thank you one last time to all of them because I'm delaying so I can find my outro here. <laughs> and uh, it was a great show tonight. Really appreciate Kevin, Baron, and Lord Mattias being here. And I hope to see you all soon.